Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Now, today I am joined by the amazing Matthew Nash. Matthew, how are you doing today, man? I'm great. How are you doing, man? I am doing very, very well. So, before we talk about why you are here, I would like for the people that don't know you to get to know you a little bit. Um, you are the director of the award-winning documentary 16 Photographs at Ordruff, which has won awards for Best Cinematography and Best Documentary. So, real quick, before we go on to this, I would like for you guys to check out the trailer to this real quick. It was early in the morning when we looked up and on the top of this hill, there was a guard tower, the first thing I spotted, because I was out front. I can't imagine being 20 years old and walking into this. This is, this is so horrible that you get your mind on this and sometimes you, you wake up at four o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning. We couldn't believe what we saw. We may not have known what we were fighting for, but once we saw the camps, we knew what we were fighting against. So guys, as you can see, that's a whole different type of horror story. Um, that was screened internationally and had been translated into German and French. Um, and it was created in collaboration with the U.S. Holocaust Museum and acquired by the Department of Defense and the Buchenwald Museum? I don't know if I'm saying oh, that right. Uh, Buchenwald, the, the, one of the, the camps is now a museum. So the, the Buchenwald Museum. Yeah, see, I would have never got that right in a thousand <laughs> million years. So uh, obviously, you know, this is something, you know, more of a very serious, very somber type of horror. Like this is real life horror. This is about as scary as you can possibly get. So what gave you the determination and the drive to want to create this documentary? Um, I mean, it started with my grandfather. You know, he died. Uh, in, the, in the early 90s, and we found the pictures that he took. Um, he was an American soldier, mm -hmm. and we found the pictures that he took at that camp. Um, and then when Obama ran for president, it turns out his uncle was also there. And that kind of kick-started me digging out those old photos and trying to learn what it meant. And, um, you know, from there, the, you know, once the snowball starts rolling downhill, you know, you start making footage and you start talking to people, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, we, we finished the film and re we released it. And then after that, I was finally able to go to Germany and meet the people there. And so it, you know, it's been 10 years since that film came out. And I would say once a week, I get an email or people send me books and photos. Um, I have a whole shelf in my office just devoted to things that people sent me from that film. So it really connects with people, with families. Um, and yeah, I, you know, you're a horror show. So, I mean, it's, it's horror of a whole other magnitude. Yeah. Um, you know, we're used to fake blood and corn syrup and, you know, prosthetic makeup and latex and stuff. But, you know, that, that, sh can we swear on your show? That, that's, yes, stuff, yes, that you can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that shit was real. Um, right. And, you know, honestly, when we finished that film, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but like I was a little immune to how horrible the stuff was because you look at those pictures all the time and you, right. you get a little dead to it. Um, and then going right into, you know, it took us five years to get walk away off the ground. And like that level of horror was, I don't want to say easy, but it was, it was a fun kind of horror. It was the, the make-believe kind. So, right. There's a huge difference between real life horror and entertainment horror. And that's something that when you can't just, you know, de you know, determine between the two, that's when there's an issue. And you, know, you just brought up walk away. That was the feature, which was released in 2020, just as the pandemic started. Um, that's won a number of awards, including best screenplay, best cinemat cinematography, and best thriller feature. Now, I do want you guys to check out this trailer as well. Is that Sam? 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 Go, 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 go. Did you make it like past where you guys were last time? Mm, no. No, it's the same thing. It's just a circle. Okay. I'm just going around. Right there? Yeah. Okay. So that's it. 
no matter where we go, we always end up back in the attic. She's in the basement. She's in the basement. Come on. Come on. This place, I just, I can't explain it. It's like it's pulling us inside. It wants us deeper inside. Why, what is it with you and what I do? You know, you're the one who's giving me this problem every day. This place should be paradise. It should be perfect. We should want to stay here forever. Why can't we? This place does something to you. You think you have it together. You have your phone. You're civilized. We're gonna die in this cabin and it's gonna be nothing to the world. It was the house. It's in my head. When we get out of here, you gotta tell everyone it was an accident because this house is 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 in it's in my it's inside my head. Who needs civilization? Who needs friendship? Who needs your hopes and dreams? Who cares? I care, Rachel. And that's because you still think you have a future. So now that you guys have seen the trailer for that as well, uh, Matthew, where can people check out Walk Away? Uh, Walk Away is currently streaming on Amazon Prime. Uh, we're on Roku channel, if you have Roku. And we're free on Tubi with ads if you want to watch it on Roku on uh, Tubi. Um, I also think we're coming to a couple platforms, although I can't announce that yet. But um, sure. I think we'll be hitting a few new platforms. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fun film. I hope people check it out. Um, Little promo here, but we're doing a, a special screening in Boston this weekend. We're we're showing Walk Away and Abaddon's Pit, which we'll talk about, um, for the first time on the big screen. Because we were supposed to premiere Walk Away March 14th, 2020, which was the first day of uh, of lockdown. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, ask me some questions. What do you want to know about Walk Away? Let's talk Walk Away. Well, I mean, this is another movie. What gave you the uh, ideas for Walk Away? What was your inspiration for this film? So I create with a partner. His name is Jason Egan. And the cabin in the film is his family owns this cabin. And it's legit on the side of a mountain, uh, solar panels. It's got a well. You get no cell service. It is in the middle of nowhere. And we used to go up there and, like, you know, we'd play guitars and, you know, drink beer and screw around. And we started talking about shooting something there. We shot a short there, but we started talking about shooting a feature there. And the way that Jay and I work is we 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 kind of start with all the ideas and then we take away and we take away and we take away until we kind of strip it down. And we we got to the idea that like, like what's a horror movie with no monsters? Like what is the most horrible thing on earth? And it's other people. Um, and so we were like, what if the whole horror of the movie is that they just can't leave? Right. And we kind of came up with this simple idea that they walk away from the cabin, they disappear, and they just reappear back in the cabin, and then that's it. There's just five of them, and they just have to deal with each other. And uh, we agreed early on when we were writing the script, we picked five people that we know of very different personality types, like old roommates and friends and whatnot. And in early drafts of the script, they're actually named after real people. We we, we changed that. Yeah. Um, and then we just kind of sat down and we're like, how would these five people deal with each other? And, you know, it doesn't take that long before people start going nuts. I mean, we all remember summer 2020 when when lockdown was in effect and you're like going nuts and, you know, people are getting divorces and things are going yeah. nuts. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we wrote it before quarantine. We wrote it before the pandemic. Um, but, yeah, we kind of accidentally made quarantine the movie. And yeah, we were just trying to picture what would happen if these folks were were stuck there. We shot the film over six months. We shot um, three four-day weekends um, in May, July, and October so we could get kind of the changing of the seasons. 
Um, we actually took a snow machine up there to do a winter sequence that we never shot. Um, oh. We just couldn't, it just never, it's too much woods to make it look authentic. Um, sure. uh, but, you know, we really wanted to to get through the the seasons. And also it gave the actors a, a, a lot of time together. So they really got to develop those, the kind of uh, subtle complexities that you get in a relationship that make you want to murder someone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been married for 18 years. Trust me. I understand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I, my wife and I just hit 25. We love each other, but you know, there are days, you know. It's like, yeah. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. And congrats on, on your 18 years. I appreciate uh, that. Now, with Walk Away, was that always destined to be a feature, or did that start as a short that you guys just developed into a feature? Well, I'm going to move my camera a little bit. You can see behind me all of these binders are films. And we yeah. Walk Away was... It was a short, it was a feature, it was a TV pilot, it was a two hour feature, it was a 90 minute feature. Like we have scripts for every conceivable variation of like what we could have done there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we went, like I said, we spent five years kind of kicking this idea around trying to figure, figure out how we were gonna make it happen. Um, at the end of the day, we cut out a lot of the side stories, a lot of the backstory. Just because budget, I mean, it was, yeah. I think it's a, I mean, it's a $30,000, $40,000 film. I mean, it was, it was a really small budget. So we just had to limit it to what we could shoot with five actors, you know, and a small crew in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, so we came in, I think it's 92 minutes or 91 minutes right now. And, you know, really just kept it the story of the people there and how they, you know, how their psychology evolves and how their brain unravels i guess you'd say um but no to answer your question i mean we we have scripts that that are every possible length and and format you could think of for that project right and, and like you said you guys can check that out on tubi on roku channel on amazon prime and soon maybe more but while we're talking about soon abaddon's pit now, by the time this is released, um, I do have one more trailer to show you guys, and we'll get there in a second, but Abaddon's Pit is something I've talked about on the channel before, so we're going to go a little more in-depth about that, but first, we want you guys to check out this trailer. Let us, for a moment, consider the mirror. What we see is an inversion of reality. Hey, can I show you something? Yeah. There are stories from old timers. The ones used to hunt out here before there were farms. Stories about a dark place. It's on fire. It's on fire. This is more than weird, Gareth. It's impossible whatever's down there we're not supposed to know about it i gotta go down there i'm going down there Gary. why y you saw what happened you've been forbidden to eat the apple david we're in eden right now don't you understand this is paradise i have to go down i have to know i'm sorry Phil.
Okay, so Abaddon's pit. Another thing, like I said, we've talked about on the channel before. So can you give us a little... We couldn't talk too much about it last time because things were still very, very much under wraps. But can you give us kind of a spoiler-free synopsis with the trailer, obviously, of what we're going to be seeing in Abaddon's pit? Yeah, you guys had you had Amy Zubieta on, who's in both Walk Away and Abaddon's Pit. We we love Amy Zubes. She's awesome. She's amazing. Um, literally created a whole part for her in Abaddon just so we could work with her again. Um, so the the super short summary of Abaddon is um, two guys find a bottomless pit that changes everything that goes into it, and one of the guys becomes convinced he can bring back his dead wife, um, and then. Things come into conflict with the local religious community. Uh, and the last third of the film really goes off the rails and becomes a very strange journey. I can't wait to check this out. And like you brought up Amy Zubieta, one of the sweetest people I've ever had the oh, pleasure of meeting. So I'm glad you guys have had the opportunity to work with her as much as you have, because she is just strictly an amazing person. And um, for those of you that have are not already. I do have all of Matthew's social media links down in the description as well. So make sure that you're following him on social media. Make sure you're checking out these films because it really does help our independent filmmakers when we're checking out their films and letting them know what we think of them. So make sure you're doing that. But also you can stay up to date on everything he has coming up in the future because this isn't he's not at the twilight of his career, guys. The sun is just rising. So make sure you're following him to stay up to date on all the things he has coming up in the future as well. So. You know, we know what you're doing now and what you're doing in the future, but in order to become a horror filmmaker, whether it's real life horror, fictionalized horror, horror had to start for you somewhere, my friend. So now I would like to go back to the past and talk about what got you started in the horror genre, your first horror movie. And Matthew, the first horror movie you watched was? The Wicker Man, the original, was it 1973, I believe? What? Um, this is such a odd movie to start your horror life with because there's just so much in this movie. It's a horror story. It's a folk story. It's a musical. It's a comedy that has a little bit of everything, the spice of this film. So do you remember about how old you were the first time you had seen it? Oh, probably, I don't know, six or seven, maybe somewhere around there. Um, so two two things. One, my parents were very religious. So we went to church multiple days per week. Mm -hmm. um so i think in my family this movie wasn't even looked at as a horror movie so much as like it, it was more of like a good christian man with lots of good music and um oh and a weird ending you know yeah. um, but also like i grew up in that era where we only had a couple broadcast channels mm -hmm. um you know before cable and everything and i was i guess lucky because we lived halfway between two big cities so we actually got all the channels from both rochester and syracuse and yeah. if, I don't know if you uh, remember, but there was always like a local channel that just played weird like movie marathons on Saturdays and the late night horror shows on whatever it was, Friday nights and stuff. And far too young, I, I we were allowed to watch all that stuff. And um, but the reason I remember The Wicker Man for some reason is that my my friends, one of my friends became obsessed with this movie um, and we would just watch it. I don't know how he got it on VHS, but we would just watch it all the time, like being way too young to be allowed to like sneak off into the basement and watch movies. And um, so certainly by the time I was like 10 or 11, I remember, you know, I had all the songs memorized. And yeah. I mean, I'm sure on TV they probably censored it because there's a lot of nudity in this film. But so I probably watched those versions that are cut into like incoherence by the TV censors. But yeah. Um, but I just I just always remember that song at the end, which I recently learned is called um, Summer is a Coming In. And it's a 13th century medieval song that that song they sing at the end. Um, fun fact. Now, nobody's seen Abaddon's Pit yet because we're premiering it this weekend. But the final scene of Abaddon's Pit, our cult stands around something very large on fire and sings our own version of Summer is a Coming In. Um, we rewrote the lyrics, but we literally wanted to reference the Wicker Man that closely. That That's we have, awesome. We have a cult standing around a burning pyre singing the exact same song they sing in the Wicker Man. So um, that's how much this movie is in my DNA. Like we, mm -hmm. you know, grew up with it. So Right. And it's one of those movies that really has to the test of time, obviously. You know, you had the Nicolas Cage remake, <laughs> yeah. um, which I don't hate like everybody else does. I am at least entertained by it. But um, this is still a lot of very effective scenery in the OG. Now, do you remember which scene it was that affected you the most? 
Well, it's weird because when I like, obviously the ending is just amazing, right? The I, are we allowed to spoil things on your show? I don't. I don't have what I. What it's I'm been forty years. If they haven't seen it, that's time's yeah. up, man. <laughs> Movies older than I am. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, when Christopher Lee and the cult stand around the wicker man and they burn Sergeant Howie alive and they sing "Summer Is a Coming In" and they're chanting and they're happy and the sun is is setting behind. It. Like it's just such a memorable, iconic scene and he's you know he's in the wicker man and he's praying to a god that won't help him as the animals scream around him like of course it's just an iconic horror scene yeah um you know and 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 it's really in a lot of ways the only horror in the whole movie is that is that final scene um but i mean the other stuff that stands out for me because i watch this movie constantly i watch this movie more than i should be allowed to but the music like i love you know the the landlord's daughter song is amazing um you know this the way that the music is just woven into the film like sorry to use a film nerd term here but it's like the music is diegetic right the music yeah. is part of the scene uh but it's also creepy and it creates the world and the characters um but it's not like a musical where everybody stops in like west side story and starts singing right it's kind of like more or less natural i guess the landlord's daughter song is a little kind of forced but you know it's still like like it just makes the whole world so creepy um i know did, were, did you re-watch it for the show or are you are you kind of oh yeah yeah oh you did cool um what's your favorite scene i i'll always be partial to digging up the bunny that's a scene oh, for yeah. me that you know as a kid it scared me so much because i didn't quite understand the you know the depth of what they were doing with the scene you know, mm -hmm. the same name with the bunny. That's a scene that's just, it's always stuck with me. It's a scene that's just in my chest, man. You know, you're <laughs> digging up something you think is a little girl and then you see a bunny. It's yeah. something that just scared me as a kid, you know? And then, like, um, another scene is when he's trying to go out to the airplane and you realize that the, you know, it's been tampered with and you mm -hmm. have all the people standing up with their animal masks. Yeah. And at this point, you're really starting to realize that there's something afoot here so they do that like early 70s horror thing where they do that sort of like smash zoom to the two faces in the window which is like oh we're scared now you know like yeah it's funny mentioning the plane i always love the opening where he's flying in and the, you know first we see him in church with his wife singing and then he's flying in on the plane um and we have that that cool kind of 70s folk song and then nobody will come get him from the plane like yeah. guy, you know he's in the little harbor and um, I was in Scotland a few years ago on the Isle of Skye, and I don't I don't know if they filmed there, but the town really looked like the little town in the film. And I was just sitting there, like from the shore, and I was like, "Oh, if there was a little seaplane out there, like dude would be stuck. Like there's nothing yeah. you can do." Um, so, you know, and that's one of the things I didn't understand as a kid, but um, like there's a subtext of this film that's very Scottish right the the english police officer is coming to a scottish island like like that sort of history of the the colonialism the history of like the way the british have treated the scottish people over the years that like you know if you go to the isle of skye they still speak gaelic and english is kind of like oh we'll we'll do that if we have to sure. um, and so all of that history i didn't know when i first watched the wicker man but you know you see it now as an adult oh gesundheit <laughs> thank you it's probably probably bad YouTubing, but I feel rude <laughs> if I don't say gaz Um So yeah, it's there's things that I catch the older I get that I'm just like, oh, the some of the horror is there's a cultural history here that yeah. as Americans we're maybe not so tuned into, but uh, now now that I'm older and understand a little more, I think that's really really cool too. And I think that's what was missing in the American remake was when they tried to make it too Americanized. They tried to make it too Western civilization. And that wasn't what the movie was about. Like, I don't, like I said, I don't hate the American remake. Like everybody else does. I'm not like, I don't poo poo that movie. I, I get entertained by it. Um, is it as good as the OG? I, I don't think so, but do I have fun with it? Absolutely. I have a blast every time I watch it. You know, Nicholas Cage alone is just enough to make gonna... this movie. Show my Mandy T-shirt here. Yes, man. That's I don't, awesome. I don't, I don't hate on Nicolas Cage. Now, I'm not with you on the liking the remake. I saw it in the theaters when it came out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's kind of like when anybody fucks with your favorite movie. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, I, I, I don't. You got to do a really good job rebooting something that I love. Sure. You know, and, and I have a, you know, like Zack Snyder's Watchmen 
really messes with a with a graphic novel that I love. And it's like, eh, you know, so I'm, I always have a hard time kind of getting into it. Like, I think if I saw the Nicolas Cage film just on its own terms, maybe I'd be a little more um, open minded to it. Yeah. Yeah. But and then not a direct remake, but of course, Mid Midsommar, the Ari Aster film is is definitely pulling from the, the Wicker Man history here. Yeah. Um, and I like Ari Aster. I mean, Hereditary was was great, and you know, I love Midsommar. Um, you know, but I, the whole time I'm watching it, I'm just like, oh, this is we're, we just we're just kind of I know where this is going. You know, right? It's um, it definitely borrowed a lot from The Wicker Man. You know, but it yeah. has some great visuals. I'm a fan of Midsommar, um, but you know, like you said, you can definitely feel uh, Wicker Man influence throughout that whole movie. And I just, I mean, I love. You know, you again. You talk to Amy Zubieta, who's in a in a film that I think has a plot similar to this. But I, I just love like a remote community, a weird cult. I love, I love where the mystery and and the suspense comes from. Sort of like, not just not knowing, but like like that weird creepiness of like a little inbred community. Or inbred is kind of overstating it, but like insular community right. being the outsider. You know, like. I mean, that's what's powerful about mysteries in general. That's what power, what's powerful about this kind of stuff. And just like as a horror film, you know, because Wicker Man predates all the good slashers. So it's like playing by different rules, you know? Yeah. I mean, 1972, 1973, like that's when the Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horror movies are coming out. Like it's, a di it's an entirely different flavor of horror that people were used to back then. Um, you know, when, when did Psycho comes out a little bit before that, I guess, but, um, you know, like the, like what we think about as horror was just different, yeah. um, you know, pre, pre slasher. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, I gotta say, you know, even in 2023, you end your film by taking ostensibly the hero of the movie, Sergeant Howie, the good guy, the only Christian in the film, right? I'm not saying Christians are good, but in the context <laughs> of the the world uh and you like burn him to death you know like like wow and you've got christopher lee you know the great christopher lee who's just mostly a villain in everything he plays dracula he plays you know he's in um lord of the rings as, as saruman like he's a he's a villain in like everything he's in and here he is as lord summer isle leading the community to you know replenish the harvest through the sacrifice of of a you know pure christian man <laughs> yeah like, and, yeah as an adult you know you're watching it and you see christopher lee when he's sitting on that chair and he spins around and you see it's christopher lee and you're like oh that's christopher lee heck yeah Hell yeah universal monsters christopher lee here to rock it on the wicker man and he didn't even get paid for this film he liked the script oh, so much that. yeah he liked the script so much he said he would do it yes i'll do i'll be a part of this film i would love to help get this made so yeah, know, I was we, reading we up on this. Like, this film is a full indie. Like, there's no... They just yeah. raised the money and did it. And, you know, just a tiny crew and a, and a tiny leadership team. And, I mean, it, you know... I mean, I love that kind of filmmaking. But it doesn't... It doesn't look like that on screen. Like, it it has production value. The acting is really strong, mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, and, like, they got a great location. And just killer script. I mean, like, that's yeah. everything. Well, when you have Christopher Lee read your script and say, yes, I'll do it. You don't have to pay me. You know you've done something right. Yeah. So, um, you know, oh, we that... talked about your first horror movie on top of other, you know, your own horror films. But now my little buddy Ghostface is here, Matthew, and he has a question <laughs> for you. What's your favorite scary movie, Matthew? My favorite what? scary movie. Yeah, your um, favorite horror movie of all time. Favorite horror movie of all time. Um... God, how do you whittle it down to just one? Like, my brain is just spinning and spinning and spinning. Um, I'm going to go... All right, I'm going to stick with the classic. I'm going to go with the classic. I'm going to go with Alien, the first Alien, Ridley Scott. I was leaning towards The Shining, which is... You know, I almost gave you that as my first movie, but I realized Wicker Man is, like, a little bit earlier. Love The Shining. Um uh oh man there's so many i recently watched all 10 hellraiser movies back to back that was a day or two days um i just saw the new scream movie which was great um i don't know i think i love all horror across the board i i don't go in for like torture porn 
you know, yeah. like the like the Saw movies aren't my thing. I don't like the I Spit on Your Grave movies are not necessarily my thing. Um, but I mean, I love when horror and comedy get together. I love Friday the Thirteenth. Um, you know, especially like the first one and then Dream Warriors. I'll watch Dream Warriors all day long. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think like the Hellraiser universe is more interesting. Although I think the films get pretty formulaic after a bit. But um, like the Hellraiser, especially when they go to space in the fourth movie, fourth movie like that's okay. Um, so yeah, uh, but I think I'm. I think I just got to stick with the classic. Like I'm trapped in a ship with a hell beast creature with acid for blood like yeah that that's final girl sigourney weaver like that's the classic you know one of the best taglines to a movie of all time in space no one can hear you scream scream. love love that movie one of the things because i teach film so one of the things i show in class is the opening scene of star wars the, the 77 and the opening scene of alien both are relatively simple you're in outer space you've got a spaceship you've got a planet could not be more different in terms of storytelling and tone and atmosphere. Like they literally use the exact same elements and the, just set up completely different, different. Universes. Yeah. Tell two completely different stories in the end. Oh yeah. Um, no, I love, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the whole alien franchise, you know, the second one with Cameron, of course, amazing. The third one with Fincher, I, I don't, I watched a documentary a while ago about, the making of that and how a lot was taken away from Fincher and they kept kind of stripping down his ideas. And, um, you know, that's the only alien film that doesn't have a director's cut. So, you know, Fincher kind of just was like, "Eh." Um, but even, even within that, there's still some great ideas. Um, And then kind of just how it spiraled out with the predators and the, the Prometheus and all that stuff. I mean, it's a, it's a world and a, and an idea that has so much to it that just kind of its origin is just this really simple little, you know, little creature. And uh-huh. I love the first Alien. I think it, it's a masterclass in suspense. Um, there's just so much great. I and mean, that's one of the movies that we still watch on VHS because it's one of those movies that deserves to be seen with a dark, grainy filter over top of it. Oh, yeah. um, you know, that's I love 4Ks. I love re-enhancements. But with a movie like Alien, keep it dark. You know, when you lighten it up too much, you take away the suspense. You take away the atmosphere. So let me adjust so the track. So you're a VHS a guy, times. right? Is you still, you still have a VHS player? Still, I do. Uh, I, I grew up in a video store, man. My mom and dad owned a mom and pop called Downtown nice. Video. So, uh, you know, VHS, Nintendo cartridges, those all mean the world to me, man. I'm a huge physical media guy in general. If Netflix wants to pull something off their uh, platform, you can't come take it off my shelf. It's mine now. <laughs> so I'm a huge physical media guy. I love watching behind the scenes. I love watching director's commentary. Um, I love deleted scenes, alternate endings. Like I'm just a huge, huge fan oh, yeah. of physical media. So I, 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 I don't have stuff. much VHS, but I still have, uh, you know, my day job is a film professor. So I've got shelves and shelves and shelves of DVDs. And I do, just like you said, I love the special features. I love that Alien 9-disc box set with the original yeah. the theatrical cut and the director's cut of every film. Um, yeah, physical media... I wish I had more space for it, you know. Like I, you know, that's that's the that's my limitation right now. Um, says the guy, you can't see it, but just to my right are three shelves of like Tales from the Crypt comics and Mad Magazine. <laughs> and I, I've got sad. plenty of space. I just fill it up with other you know, stuff. stuff. Um, yeah, and I, I mean that's the stuff I grew up with. Like somewhere around like sixth grade, I discovered Mad Magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, but somebody gave me a book about the history of it, and that's what you know, introduced me to Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horror and, and all those 50s horror comics. And I just became, like, obsessed. Sure. Um, and, you know, up until that point, I think I was pretty scared of horror. Like, I probably wasn't going to a lot of sleepovers and watching, you know, uh, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street movies. Um, but HBO's Tales from the Crypt series, again, I love where, where comedy and horror yeah. kind of hit each other. I, that's a that's a real sweet spot. Um and yeah, Tales from the Crypt is cheesy as heck now, but when you're like in seventh grade, man, that's the that's the best stuff in the world. But when you got that POV shot going through the mansion and then down into the Crypt Keeper, like terrifying, man. As a oh, kid, terrifying. So good. And then the, the Crypt Keeper jumps up laughing, like laughing. Oh, Tales from the Crypt. And the, the blood comes out. Oh, yes, they were so cheesy, but so good. Yeah. Um, actually, weird. One of the things I show my students. Um, there's actually in the, I mentioned earlier, the seventies films, there's actually two stories in the seventies films that were made in the nineties TV show. 
So I actually have my students read the original comics and then we can watch both the 70s and the 90s versions yeah. and compare how they change. The, the, um, the 70s one is the one with Santa Claus. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, the, they do it in the 90s too. But um, Joan Collins is in the 70s one. Um, and then the other one that I show has uh, uh, Grand Moff Tarkin from Star Wars oh. in, in the 70s version. Um, and there's another one in the 70s film that I don't show, but it has the uh, the Doctor Who, the famous one with the scarf and the afro. Mm -hmm. So this is like, like, go back and watch those films. There's some crazy ass people. Yeah. Um, just like, to bring it back around, Christopher Lee turning up in The Wicker Man. Mm -hmm. I when you to always get that little bit of, oh, you know, when you see it for the first time. So, man, I've had an amazing time talking. No, about it's great to meet you, man. Film. Yeah, The Wicker Man talking about Alien. Uh, but we always end this with the same question, Matthew. We're going to go back to The Wicker Man. And what we're going to do is rank this movie on a skull count. Now, we're not ranking The Wicker Man on acting, production, score, direction. Nothing like that. We're not being critics. What we're doing here is strictly ranking The Wicker Man on how much it affected you on your first viewing. So zero skulls being not effective. Five being extremely effective. You can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. Uh, Matthew, what would your ranking of The Wicker Man be? That is a great question because I would say a lot of the movie, you know, isn't really horror-y. You know, there's a lot of scarier things out there. Um, but, you know, especially when you're young and watching a dude get burned alive while people sing around, stand around and sing, that's, that's going to stick with you. Um, yeah. You know, and in a lot of ways, like the stuff that gets into your head and stays in there is a lot more powerful than, you know, watching somebody's face get ripped off or something like sure. that. So I'm going to go relatively high, but would you say it's one to five here? Yep. I'm going to go three and a quarter, three skulls, one jawbone. Awesome. And that jawbone is open. <laughs> so, um, and I agree, you know, like I said, there are definitely scarier things out there, but that ending scene alone is, and especially because when you're watching the movie, you have a lot of hope. You know, mm -hmm. they're filling you with hope throughout the movie, and well, that and that's, gets dashed that final, pretty fucking quickly there at the end. Well, yeah, that, that final thing where you're like, oh, the, the detective has put on a costume, and he's going to go with them, and he's going to solve the mystery, and, like, you know, the 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 Agatha Christie detective will jump out at the end and, like, like reveal the crime and all that stuff. You're like, okay, we're, we're finally getting to the, you know, what I expect from every episode of Columbo and Murder, She Wrote, and instead <laughs> you get, like, nope, we're we're doing the burning people alive thing today. So, um, yeah, it's a great, we've ending. all wanted to see that every now and then. So <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> well, and I did say it at the beginning guys, but we are at the end of the third act. The credits are about to roll. The curtain's about to drop. But before that happens, like I said, at the beginning, all of Matthew's social media links are down in the description below. So make sure you're following him on social media so you can stay up to date on everything he has coming up in the future. You can be one of the first ones to see the Abaddon when that comes out, Abaddon Pit. So make sure that you guys are all a part of this. Uh, Matthew, please don't go anywhere. i got a couple more questions for you. Um, everybody else, if you haven't already, make sure you like, subscribe, and follow Sledgehammer Horror. We would love to have you along for the ride on social media as well, and it really helps out more than you know. Until next time, keep talking horror. Stay what you are. Thanks for having me.